العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم مصطفى محمد علي محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity. He provides for us opportunities such as these where we gather together in remembrance of Him, tabarak wa ta'ala. Next, we send our heartfelt condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Imam al Hujja, Jalallahu ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Muhammad. And to each and every one of you as we gather to commemorate the istishhad anniversary of his grandfather and our 10th Imam, Imam Ali Al-Naki Al-Hadi, alayhi afdalu salatu wa salam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We are now, alhamdulillah, um, well into the month of Rajab. Um, the third day of Rajab today will be the fourth night tonight. Um, and as you are aware, as you looked in the calendars, there's a... Um, quite a few functions in the month of Rajab alone um, and since we've um, also discussed in the previous lecture that this is the month in which we consider um, the flow of the mercy of God to be continuous um, uh, this is why in one of the traditions they say that in this month mercy is poured upon the believers as though a jug is being poured out upon the earth for example so it is continuously um, a month in which we can strive closer to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and most importantly we have to use this month as a launching pad um, to make sure that we enter the holy month of Ramadan fully prepared to maximize on the spirituality that is available on that month taking all of these things into consideration um, I thought it'd be important that we have one unifying theme for the entire month of Rajab because of the numerous functions in there rather than having individual lectures um, let's try to have one theme um, that can cover the entire month inshallah um, and again the, the aim or the objective of that theme is that it should prepare us for the holy month of Ramadan um, to be fully engrossed in that spirituality and the theme that we have selected for this month um, and may, it may continue for the next month as well because this is a very vast topic um, and the topic is the importance and the role of ibadah Ibadah we mean worship. So it's the importance and the role of ibadah um, in the purification of the soul. Yeah? Um, so it is learning about what it means to be an abd. Uh, it is learning about what it means to um, enter into the realm of ubudiyah. And to also understand why it is, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made wajib upon us so many different obligations. All of these, there is a purpose behind all of this. And the aim um, that is there before all, everything that has been made wajib upon us, everything that has been recommended for us, is that the end result of all of these things will be the purification of our soul. Sometimes we fail to realize that we, don't, we may not understand why, for example, I have to pray Salatul Fajr. What role does that have in my life? Why do I have to fast? Why do I have to give Sadaqah? Um, but what we will conclude 
Um, from every lecture inshallah is that nothing is done arbitrarily by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything has a specific purpose and the purpose behind all of this is that it will purify our soul and if we understand this then um, I think we can truly maximize on the holy month of Ramadan and the month of Rajab as well and the months that are coming after that so in trying to understand the importance of ibadah um, in the purification of their soul the first thing we have to understand is what is meant by abd yeah. Um, abd in the Arabic language could mean a slave, it could mean a servant. But what is important to understand is that if we're trying to understand Abd, uh, we have to understand the opposite of Abd. And the opposite of Abd is Mawla. Yeah. So whenever there is an Abd, there has to be a Mawla who that Abd is serving. Yeah? If there is no Mawla, there is no Abd. Yeah? Then you are a free person, for example. You do what you want. But whenever there is a Mawla, it means that there is an Abd who is serving that Mawla. And whenever there is an Abd, um, and whenever there is an Abd, there means that there is a Mawla who is being served by that Abd. Yeah? You all with me so far? Yeah? So if we understand that, then, then we understand then by definition that an Abd is a person, is a human being, who realizes that they themselves do not have the power um, or the desire or the will to do anything in life. Yeah? That they themselves do not, uh, do not possess the quwa, the ability um, to, to have their own will manifested, their own desires manifested, to act out in any way. Rather, they submit to the will and the desires and the power of their mawla. Yeah? This is who an Abd is. Okay? An Abd is one who himself or herself realizes and recognizes that they do not possess any power, do not possess any will, do not possess any um, desires. Yeah? They don't. And rather their entire purpose of life is to meet the desires and the will and the irada of their mawla. This is how the Abd and the Mawla relationship works, right? After having established that if there is an Abd, there has to be a Mawla, okay? Um, so if we understand that then, if we understand that definition of what it means to be an Abd, yeah? Um, again, I repeat it because it's very important we understand. Um, an Abd is not given to any person just like that, yeah? An Abd is a title which is earned. And that means that when a person enters the realm of Ubudiyya, what they have done is that they have realized and submitted to the fact that they themselves do not have any power. They themselves do not have any desires. They themselves do not have any will for anything. Rather, they submit to the power and will and desires of their Mawla, okay? If we understand this definition, then we can conclude with two very important facts. The first is that no human being can get the title of Mawla because no human being deserves that type of subservience. Yeah? It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who deserves the title of Mawla because it is only He who deserves and has earned the right to be followed in this manner. Yeah? Now we can go into theological discussions to discuss why, but I think that would be pointless. Right? Because we all agree on the fact that it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who deserves to be worshipped in this manner and none of us deserve to be worshipped in this manner. If it was a different crowd, we could go into theological discussions about that, but I don't think that would be a point here. So we can take that as an established fact, yeah? that no human being can be considered a mawla. Yeah, by this definition of mawla. It's very important we keep this definition in mind. So it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has earned that title of mawla. This is the first point that we can conclude. The second point that we can conclude then is that to enter, if, if one enters this realm, this realm of ubudiya, what it means um, is that they have reached the the last stage of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah um, because it is only one who is willing to submit entirely to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where they are willing and able to let go of their own desires they're willing and able to let go of their own wishes to submit to the wishes and desires of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah? Therefore, obudiya, servitude, is only attained when one is willing to completely submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Therefore, we can conclude then that we cannot be called abd. 
Yeah, we cannot be called a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until and only we reach that final stage of complete taslim, complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we understand that, then that's a very fascinating um, position. Because then when we look at the Holy Quran, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, uses the word abd to describe his servants, he is targeting those servants who have, been, who have submitted completely to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, this is not an easy stage to get to. Yeah? First, you may, for example, enter the stage um, of faith of Iman, um, not even Iman, you, pay, you first submit to Islam and then you get to Iman um, and then you may get to for example um, Ikhlas and then you may get to even a higher level and a higher level but the final stage that one can reach to, that graduating level where you are, uh, where you are given your diploma is when you are then able, when th you are then um, ready to be called an Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So Ubudiyah is a very high level yeah? It's something that we can't take for granted We often take that for granted We are servants of God But that's not what it means yeah? Ubudiyah is that highest level of complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And what is very interesting then yeah? um, Is if we understand um, Then that the Abd is so submitted to his Mawla that they have now developed an interlocking connection with each other where now um, the, the servant begins to manifest the qualities of his mawla. Yeah? Um, you all with me? Yeah? It's, it sounds fancier than it is to be quite honest. Yeah? Um, the, the, the position is that when a person reaches that stage of obudiya, um, they begin to have such a powerful connection to their mawla um, that their, they be, the mawla begins to reflect his divine qualities into the abd. Yeah? And now the servant begins to exhibit divine qualities. Yeah? Begins to uh, exhibit, for example, the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Begins to exhibit, for example, the qualities of jalal the qualities of Jamal, all of this because they have submitted themselves to such an extent where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has embraced him with his faith, yeah? has embraced him with his, his glory. And this is very beautifully highlighted um, by a tradition from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Umma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Where he says, this is a very beautiful hadith. Yeah? He says, um, Al-Ubudiyah to Jawharatun. Yeah? That Ubudiyah is a jewel. Yeah? It's a Jawhar. It's a, ju it's a jewel. Kunhuha ar rububiyah yeah? And the substance of that jewel is rububiyah, is lordship. Yeah? That alone is takes, it takes pondering. Yeah? Reflect on that for a quick second. And then he explains it further. He says that servitude is a jewel whose substance is lordship, is rububiya. And then he goes on to explain. He says, فَمَا فُقِدَ مِنَ الْعُبُودِيَا وُجِدَ فِي رُبُوبِيَا وَمَا خُفِيَ عَنِ الْعُبُودِيَا أُصِيبُ فِي الْعُبُودِيَا yeah, it's very beautiful. Um, it's a very deep hadith. Okay, I'll read it again for the Arabic understanding people, and then we'll translate it into English. Al ubudiya tu jawharatun kunhuha al rububiya, fa ma fuqida min al ubudiya wujida fil rububiya, wa ma khufiya an al rububiya usibu fil ubudiya. Yeah? He says that servitude is a jewel whose substance is lordship. And whatever is missing in servitude will be found in lordship. Yeah? And whatever is hidden of lordship can only be obtained through servitude. Yeah? Amazing. Amazing hadith. Okay? It's deep a little bit. I understand. Yeah, I had to read it five or six times. Okay? Um, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll read the English one more time the way I did the Arabic. Servitude is a jewel. Whose substance is lordship. Yani the, what is made up of is lordship. So the only way one can be a servant is when they are completely engrossed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore the substance of that servant is nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Yeah? They are composed of the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are composed of the divine qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why they are a jewel, right? Because whatever God has to ha offer is rare, right? So he's saying servitude is a jewel whose substance is lordship. Whatever is missing in servitude will be found in lordship. Therefore, when I, for example, have submitted myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of my ability, if there are qualities within me which are missing if there are qualities within me which are lacking that God wants Allah will give it to me because it is found in Lordship yeah therefore when I submit um, when I submit it doesn't mean that I have attained 100% perfection right so God wants me to be patient God wants me to be this this and this and this um, I submit to whatever God wants yeah, I submit wholeheartedly. And wherever I am falling short, I will find it in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? He will give it to me in His rububiyyah. And وَمَا خُفِيَا عَنِ الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ أُصِيبُ فِي الْعُبُودِيَّةِ And whatever is hidden of lordship. What does that mean? Whatever is hidden of lordship. What that means is that when I, as a regular person, am trying to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I find Him too far away to connect, I don't understand how to connect. Once I submit and become an abd, everything that is unclear about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be made perfectly clear to me. Yeah? You understand? Yeah? This is a very high level that we are talking about. And this is what um, is available to us. It's not something, God does not describe something and they say, haha, you can't get to it. Yeah, He doesn't do that. Yeah, He doesn't do that. Um, God describes something and then says, now go get it. I will help you get it. Yeah? And the way to get it yeah, is through obudiyah. Yeah, is through servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are in those months right now, my brothers and sisters. Yeah? We are in those months right now where servitude is, is a gift waiting to be unopened, to be unwrapped for us. Yeah? We just have to make those efforts to try to reach that. And when we do, you will notice dunya and akhirah will be given to us in a platter inshaAllah. Yeah? So this is what we are trying to get to, to understand how is it that obudiyah, um, will purify my soul to that extent um, where everything will be given to me. Everything. Yeah? There will be nothing that will be hidden from me. And this is what um, um, we are trying to get to. Okay, inshallah. And this is, um, it's not a process. It's not, um, I mean, it's a process. I mean, uh, these series of lectures may take five or six lectures. Allahu A'lam. Yeah? Um, but um, we have done this throughout the years sometimes where we've taken a month to discuss a specific subject. Um, and um, this is what we will do for this month of Rajab, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us with that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. When we look at, so today inshallah the aim was to look at the Holy Quran and verses of the Quran which talk about Ubudiyah. But I don't think we'll get to, get, we'll get to finish because we still need to talk about um, our 10th Imam alayhi salam. But when we look at the, the verses, we'll look at one verse of the Holy Quran. Um, when we look at Abd in the Quran, if you just put in the root word of Abd with all of its different conjugations, Ibadah, um, Abidun, whatever it is, it appears in the Quran 275 times. Yeah? Um, that means 275 times um, God is directly talking about servitude. Directly, yeah, because he mentions the word Abd. Okay, um, so when we look at, for example, some examples of that, uh, we'll discuss one the, the verse that I read in the sermon. It comes from Surah Al Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, i'budu rabbakum alladhi khalakakum walladhi lam il kablikum la'allakum tattakun. Yeah? He says, O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and those who came before you so that you may be God wary. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ okay? So this is a verse of the Quran which directly talks about Ubudiyah because the word Abd is there, right? He says, O mankind, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اِعْبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ yeah? خَلَقَكُمْ yeah? Uh, if we can move forward, please. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Second one, please. Can you give me some water? 
اللهم صل على محمد in some water. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala um, in this verse, Surah Al Baqarah, verse twenty one, He says, "O mankind, worship your Lord, um, who created you and those who were before you, so that you may be." God wary. What is very interesting about this particular verse is there's three things that come to our minds right away. The first is that the address that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing is to all of mankind. Yeah? So he's not just talking to believers. He doesn't say, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu a'budu rabbukum. No, he doesn't say that. He says, O mankind, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means the order of ibadah is not reserved or um, specified just for believers. Rather, every human being has been given the order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is describing the vastness, you can say, um, of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? That um, the invitation has been given to all of mankind. So this is the first thing we understand about this verse. Secondly, when God talks about the why they should worship him. He says, اِعْبُدُوا رَبُّكُمْ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here taps into intellectual deduction. Yeah? He says, look, why should you worship me? Because I created you, God says. Yeah? Therefore, if I created you, I own you. And if I own you, I am the one who deserves to be obeyed, nobody else. Yeah? Intellectual deduction, right? isn't it? If somebody possesses something, let's say I own something, and you come and play with it, I have a right to tell you how to play with it, when to play with it, and when to stop playing with it, isn't it? Yeah? It's mine. Yeah? Who are you to tell me how to play with it, for example? So the same rule applies, Hassan, the same rule applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I am the Khaliq. Yeah? Therefore, if I am the Khaliq, I am the Malik. Yeah? And therefore, if I am the Malik, I am the Mawla as well, and I deserve to be worshipped. So it's a very intellectual step-by-step um, -step deduction that though he doesn't mention all of this, it's clear for somebody who thinks about verses of the Qur'an. Yeah? That why did God say, worship me, I created you? What is the link between these two? And the third point, which is very important to understand, is if you worship me, the outcome of that worship will be what? Yeah? God weariness, Ahsantum, it's the only person taking notes here. Yeah? La'allakum tattakun. Yeah? La'allakum tattakun. That the outcome will be that you will become a muttaqi. Yeah? So you see, um, gifts will, be, will begin um, to, to become manifest. Yeah? Once we begin to get into the stage of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that means is that I don't have to be a muttaqi to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Uh, but I have to strive towards it. Once I become a servant of God, He will allow me to become a muttaqi. Yeah? Once I become the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give me the gifts that He has promised to give me. So we have to first and foremost submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the, that's the ultimate goal of Islam, is to submit. I don't ask why. I don't have a right to ask why. Yeah? Though our aima were gracious in answering questions of why. Yeah? Our scholars are gracious in asking the, or answering the questions of why. But I as a human being, if I consider myself to be an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't have a right to ask him why. Yeah? The same way, for example, um, if somebody, like I said, if somebody owns something, I don't have a right to ask him why I can't play with it. It's not mine. You, you tell me and I'll do it, isn't it? Um, so the same rule applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first verse of the Holy Quran which directly talks about ibadah. And as I said, there are 275 such verses of the Qur'an which directly touch upon ibadah. Next, uh, on Thursday, inshallah, we will discuss verses which indirectly talk about ibadah in the Qur'an. And when we look at the number of verses that indirectly talk about ibadah, we find that nearly the entire Qur'an is talking about ubudiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? We're talking about verses which don't have the word abd in there. Yeah? But we find that the entire Qur'an is a manuscript or a blueprint on how to be the best servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah ta'ala we will discuss that on Thursday if life is given to us inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Amma salli ala Muhammad. Tonight we are gathered also to commemorate 
the istishad anniversary of our 10th Imam, Imam Ali Naki Al Hadi, Alayhi Afdalu Salatu was Salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, when we're talking about Ubudiyah, if the Quran is a, is, a, is a blueprint on how to be the best servant of God, naturally the, the life of the Aimma or the Ahlul Bayt are blueprints on how to be the best servant of God, isn't it? Um, because they are the spoken version of the Quran. So when we look at the life of the Ahlul Bayt, and specifically if we were to look at the life of our 10th Imam, alayhi salam, we would find um, a very beautiful guideline on how to be the best servant possible of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And... Um, I want to just look at two traditions or two ahadith um, about or narrated from our Imam, which if, if followed or looked into or contemplated, it will really help us in being that good servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the first hadith, it is said, Qala uh, Abu al-Hasan al-Thalith. Abu al-Hasan al-Thalith um, is, 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 means our tenth Imam. So whenever this is uh, the father of Hassan the third, because there are two Abu al-Hasan before him, isn't it? So Abu al-Hasan al-Thalith alayhi salam annahu qal al-musibatu lissab yeah. He says the difficulty for the patient is one, while the impatient is two. Yeah. Yeah, let that marinate for a second. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. The difficulty by the patient is one, yeah. and by the impatient is two. Yeah, um, yani be patient. Yeah, you'll you'll be, you'll face less difficulty in life. What is very interesting when we um, uh, when we look at the Quran, obviously patience is one of the key principles of good morality, isn't it? Of good akhlaq, of how to be a successful servant. Rather, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, for example, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salah. Yeah, Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. He says, O you who believe, um, take recourse. Yeah, in patience, right? And salah, indeed God is with those who are patient. So patience is one of the key understandings or key principles in Islam. Uh, when we look at this specific tradition, again, he says, Al-Musibatu lil-Sabir wahid, uh, wahida wa lil ithnatan. When we try to understand that, I think there are a couple of points that come to mind. The first is, Musiba will happen whether you are patient or impatient. Yeah? Life is going to be full of Musiba. Yeah? So this is, I think, a one point that we can deduce from this automatically that um, doesn't mean if I'm patient, I'll not face difficulty. No, whether you're patient or impatient, you will face difficulty, right? So this is, uh, I think, the first point that we can swallow and completely understand. The second point is that for the patient one, the difficulty um, is just, um, is one. And what we mean by that one is his difficulty is in being patient. Yeah, it's not saying that by being patient you will not have difficulty. No, being patient is difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So the difficulty that a patient person will face is only one, and that is being patient. Yeah. The impatient person um, will have the difficulty of anxiety, and then they'll still have to deal with the musibah on top of that. Yeah. And so the Imam is saying that why why put yourself through that anxiety? You know, people um, often do that in life that. Um, they worry so much, for example, about their interview tomorrow. They worry so much about how they're going to pay rent a month away. When God says, I'll take care of it, relax. Yeah? Um, you work hard and I'll take care of it. Uh, we worry about so many things which are beyond our control, when if we were just to become patient, um, we would have much less difficulty in life. Not to say no difficulty, less difficulty, right? Um, and there's a very beautiful proverb um, in English. Um, it says, don't trouble troubles. Yeah, this is this is cool. Listen to this. Yeah, don't trouble troubles till troubles trouble you, for it will only double trouble and trouble others too. Yeah, <laughs> all right. You get that? Let me repeat that. It's kind of cool, isn't it? Don't trouble troubles. Yeah, till trouble troubles you. Very the same thing the hadith is saying. Yeah, trouble will come, but why trouble it before it comes to you? Let it come to you and then deal with it. Right? Don't trouble trouble. Um, Till trouble troubles you. For if you do, it will only double the trouble. This is exactly what the hadith is saying. Subhanallah, yeah? Um, and trouble others too. Yeah? So when you are that impatient person, not only are you going to bother yourself, you're going to bother your wife, you're going to bother your family, you're going to bother everybody with your impatience, when just relax, deal with it, and it will come to you eventually, and then deal with it at that time. So this is um, the first hadith that the Imam mentions, which I believe if we apply to our lives, um, 
we will become better servants, right? Because it will make us understand first and foremost that a musibah will come to me. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, as a servant, I completely um, submit to the fact that I will be faced with difficulties. But how to deal with those difficulties is in that patient manner that he is talking about. The second hadith is also, I think, very pertinent to our lives. Um, this is a hadith, Ruya an Abi Hashim al Ja'fari annahu qal asabatni diqatun shadidatun fasirtu ila Abi Hassan Ali ibn Muhammad alayhi salam fasta'adantu alayhi sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Fa'adhina li. Yeah, so he says, this person says that um, by the name of Abi Hashim al-Ja'fari, he says that I was in a patch of very, um, with, uh, in extreme confinement, deek, um, meaning he's talking about financial difficulty. Yeah? I was in a very tight spot, basically. Right? Um, and he says, in this condition, I went to the house of our 10th Imam salam, and I asked for permission to enter. He gave me permission to enter. فَلَمَّا جَلَسْتُ قَالَ يَا أَبَا Hashim. أَيُّ نِعْمِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ تُرِيدُ أَن تُعَدِّيَا شُكْرَهَا yeah? So the Imam salam looks at his pitiful state when he comes in. Yeah? Um, his face, you can imagine, if somebody is going through difficulty, um, it's very difficult for us to hide that from our face, isn't it? So we'll show that we are distressed. So the Imam salam sees him in a state of distress, and he looks at him and he says, Ya Aba Hashim, which one of God's blessings do you want to be grateful for right now? Yeah? Subhanallah. Yeah? Subhanallah. He doesn't say to him, Oh Ba Hashim, what's the problem? Yeah? What's wrong? Yeah? He says to him in a very polite way, yeah? we might have used some different language, isn't it? Yeah? Like deal with it, snap out of it. But the Imam says, which one of God's blessings do you want to be grateful for right now, Abba Hashim? Yeah? This time Abba Hashim says, um, Falam adri ma He says, I became silent. Yeah? I became speechless and I didn't know what to say. He says, I didn't know what to say. So he says, the Imam began to thank for my behalf. Yeah? He says, Oh Abba Hashim, the first thing that you should be grateful for is that God has provided you with the rizq of Iman for which will protect you from the fire of Jahannam. Yeah? The second thing, O oh Abba Hashim, you should be grateful for is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you good health which allows you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, third, O oh Abba Hashim, you should be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you contentment, qana'a in life which allows you to maintain good akhlaq. Yeah? You don't deprive yourself and lower yourself in a manner where you have to put yourself down to get what you need. You are content. At this time, Imam salam looks at him and he says, Oh Abba Hashim, here's a hundred dinar, go and get what you want in life. Yeah? I think this is a very powerful message, my brothers and sisters. Yeah? Um, sometimes in life, um, we are faced with a very small task or a very small obstacle um, and we feel like the world is falling down on our heads. Yeah? Uh, it feels like we're carrying the entire burden of the world on our shoulders um, when the reality is um, we have probably an infinite time, infinite amount of things we can be grateful for. Yeah, we can be grateful for. Um, there's always, always, if you're going through difficulty, there is no doubt somebody in this world is going through worse than you are right now. That's the first thing. Secondly is we fail to realize what goodness God has given us, right? And thirdly, even if we are facing a difficulty, that difficulty in itself is a sign of honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Because why, if, if He did not find me worthy of test, yeah, He would not test me. Right? Um, and this is something that it should be a badge of honor um, for us believers, is that for us, musibah, difficulty, um, is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should be thankful for these opportunities that are presented for us. This was some of the advice that the Aima alayhi salam um, gave, especially our 10th Imam alayhi salam. And it is said that this type of love and garner that the Imam alayhi salam earned um, could not be handled by the Abbasid Khulafa. And it is said that after the death of Mutawakkil, his uh, Mu'tamid came into power. Um, and after a little bit of time, Mu'tamid um, could not handle um, the Imam alayhi salam's um, 
the, the people who used to gather around the Imam, the loyalty that the Imam had, um, the virtues and the knowledge of the Imam, it became too much of a burden for Mu'tamid to handle. And it is at this time, it is said, he inserted fatal poison into a pomegranate and he sent it to the Imam. It is said when the Imam alayhi salam ate the pomegranate, the poison reacted all over his body and immediately he had to be bedridden. It is said the Imam alayhi salam suffered from such pain that he could not lay down on one side if the Imam was on his back he could not find comfort so he would have to turn to his side and the Imam alayhi salam continued in this state Rahimallahu man nada wa imama Rahimallahu man nada wa madluma it said when the pain became too unbearable for the Imam to handle at this time the Imam alayhi salam faced the Qibla sweat beads began to drop from the head of the Imam alayhi salam and the Imam took his last breath in this life my brothers and sisters we can imagine the condition of our 11th Imam to find that his father was no more in this dunya we can imagine the grief faced by the Imam as he washed the janazah of his father ah but then when we think about that we imagine the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for three days it remained on the plains of Karbala without any ghusl, without any kafan. It is said once when Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam was sick he invited some of his companions to see him and one was by the name of Dawood al-Ja'fari he says to Dawood Dawood I want you to go to the zari of Imam al Hussein and pray for my shafa the Imam the companion looks at him and says oh ya bina Rasulillah but you are the Imam why should I go all the way to Karbala to which the Imam replies laysa haqadha inna lillahi mawa he says it is not like this Dawood he says God has placed certain places in which he has promised to accept the duas of one who goes and one such place is under the zari of Aba Abdullah and this is because la yawm ka yawm ka ya Aba Abdullah فَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَيَمُونَ قَلَبِي يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَلَا عَقِبَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَا تَمَيْ حُسَيْنَ